Okay, so um, I want to thank Sean and all the organizers, including myself, who is on the scientific committee, apparently, um, for inviting me here. I had tons of fun. Um, That's not real. What is not real? I have. I bought two. Oh. I have real bonsai soap oh, in my in my room, but this one is so cute. It yeah, is a fishy. So um, love the soap. Um, it's actually safely in my backpack because yeah. I ain't gonna use that. I mean, who has the heart to use that soap? <laughs> um, beautiful scenery. A very nice city tour. Concert. We have two wonderful concerts, and I ran into that little guy. Um, two days ago when I was um, so smart of me to take a walk in the dark all by myself. And when I saw that, I didn't run. I took a picture first and then I ran. Okay, um, so, um, I, so um, I'm interested in modeling diseases and we have mathematical models of different scales. So um, today's talk, I'll probably be focusing on the um, bigger scale model, the animal scale model that, you know, when you have, um, I'm interested in high blood pressure. So when you have high blood pressure, you take this drug, you eat this bag of potato chips, what is gonna be your blood pressure? Or if you have diabetes, you eat that very nice croissant, or you think there's no sugar, there's a huge amount of it, or drink the orange juice outside, what happened to your blood sugar. And of course, we are basically a collection of organs. So I told you the skinny will make an appearance um, and it will make more appearances. So um, I like to focus us on uh, focus on individual organs. And most of the time, the kidneys because I love it. Um, and then the, or, um, the function of organs is a result of, you know, is little parts. So um, organ scale model um, is composed of cellular scale model, um, which can go all the way down to mitochondria or, you know, um, really, really detailed signaling um, protein. So um, I'm interested in everything because everything is fun and I have wonderful students who do, you know, awesome work for me. Um, so um, I usually talk about three diseases, but that's really too much because we get hungry and want to have lunch. So I'm going to fun um, focus on, first I'm going to talk about um, one study that I've done um, related to hypertension and then I'll talk about um, Another one that I basically didn't do, Mesha did, I was a cheerleader, um, but I thought it was really cool, so I'll talk about his awesome work. Okay, ready to talk about blood pressure? All right, so um, a lot of people have high blood pressure. Um, and what I want to talk about is something called triple whammy. Who has heard of triple whammy? You know what that is? Okay. I will tell you, and this is what this you know, first part of the talk is about. So triple whammy is what will happen, bad things, that will happen to your kidney if you take a combination of three rather common drugs. Okay, so most of us, um, I think the old people kind of laugh, so most of you are you know, kind of young, so you don't have high blood pressure yet, but when you get older, you watch out. So when you have high blood pressure, <laughs> when, you, when, you do, when you have high blood pressure, um, you are usually given not just one, but a combination of drugs. Okay, maybe at the beginning, okay, when you're not that bad, they give you one drug. But then, you know, trust me, it will get worse. And then they'll give you two, and then you might have three, okay? So there are a different type of drugs you can take. So when Richard was giving his talk, I asked him about, uh, you remember the, 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 the hypertensive drug that I asked him about? It has to do with calcium. No, no one care. I was talking and no one care what I was saying. Fine, okay. So um, that one targets your, um, your, your um, uh, muscle cell. So that is a drug that makes your blood vessel relax a bit, okay, which will reduce your blood pressure. That is not the kind of drug I'm talking about, okay? So just imagine if you have high blood pressure, how can you lower your blood pressure? So basically when you have high blood pressure, your heart is trying really, really hard to push all that blood around your body, right? That's high blood pressure, okay? So if you kind of reduce some of the blood, reduce the volume that you have in your body, it will make it easier for your heart, right? Okay, so you can, you know, do bloodletting, but we are in the modern world, we don't do that. So we take drugs that have similar effect, okay? So one type of drug that is quite common, okay, is called diuretics. You heard of that? Basically water pill. 
you take it and you pee a lot, <laughs> which will work, okay, which will reduce your blood pressure. So you can take that, okay? Um, and if that doesn't work well enough, you can take another type of drug. It, um, it's called ACE inhibitor or AR, uh, another type of ARB. <laughs> so these are drugs that also make you pee more, actually excrete sodium, salt more, but it target different part of your body. So the direct target directly at your kidney, and these you know, um, uh, ACE inhibitor, some other drug that's similar, target a certain hormone system, non-sex hormone system, which eventually will have the effect of having you excrete more salt, okay? So when you have high blood pressure, you want to get rid of the salt in your body and get rid of water, okay? So that will be good for your blood pressure. So these are the drugs that do that. So a lot of people who have high blood pressure walk around taking these two drugs simultaneously. Okay, and these two together should be quite effective in lowering your blood pressure, okay? So you don't want high blood pressure because it's gonna give you a stroke, it's going to you know, hurt your eye, your nerve, and it will hurt your kidney, which is very bad, okay? So you wanna do that. So a lot of people have been taking this chronically. They take it you know, forever. It's not gonna kill you, okay? It will you know, make you die a little later. Okay, so this is okay, two drugs, okay? So let's see when does the third one appear. Do you know what NSAID is? It's a type of painkiller. Ipiprovin is one example, okay? So um, not all painkillers are NSAID. Um, Tylenol is not NSAID, but very common um, painkillers are, are NSAID. So let's say you have high blood pressure, you walk around taking these two, okay? Um, so this morning, I don't know, last night you were out drinking with friends, okay? So this morning you woke up with a hangover or headache, okay? Or you think about, oh, Anita's gonna give a talk, so I have a headache. So you are not feeling good, okay? So let's just walk over to the pharmacy and pick yourselves up some uh, ibuprofen. Okay, you don't even need a prescription for it. Okay, it's just, I don't, a lot of Americans don't even think about it. I don't know how Europeans feel about painkiller. A lot of Americans don't even think about it when we take this. Okay, just pop it like candy. Okay, so you pop this. Uh, together, you know, we're, at the same time, you're taking these guys. What's the problem? This is a pretty benign thing. No, um, some people, not everybody, okay, about, 20 some percent of, the, of people, when they take enough of this, they end up getting acute kidney injury, okay? That is no joke at all, okay? If you have acute kidney injury, sometimes you recover from it, sometimes you do not, and if you do not recover from acute kidney injury, you are on dialysis. Okay, which is no joke at all. You don't actually recover from dial having to do dialysis, okay? You're just on dialysis machine the rest of your life, and that is not funny, okay? So, what I'm interested in is understanding the mechanism that go from taking rather benign sounding drug to having serious effects. And also, what's also interesting to me is that how come some patient, okay, when they take this drug, they are fine, right? Um, but some other patients are more susceptible to this acute kidney injury. So I want to understand what makes some people really, really sick. Okay, so um, all this have to do with blood pressure regulation. So I just I'm just gonna give a you know a 101 on blood pressure regulation. Okay. So you want to maintain your blood pressure at a certain level. So when your body detects that, you're kind of off the mark, okay? Let's say your blood pressure is a little lower than I want, okay? How do you detect that? Well, there are some sensors that gonna see, try to see how concentrated your blood is. If your blood is too concentrated, then it's an indication that you don't have enough fluid, okay? So your blood pressure is probably low. Or there are what's called bioreceptor. It actually kind of measure the, the pressure in your blood. So if any of these sounds and alarm, okay, your blood pressure is too low, then your body try to do something, okay? So if your, if your blood pressure is too low, what you can do, you can either increase the volume in your blood, okay, you want more liquid in there, okay, more, more blood, or you can squeeze it, okay? You have the same volume, but you reduce the resistance, so, you know, pressure should go up, okay? So there are two things you can do. You can either try to increase the amount of fluid in your body. Well, how can you do that? Well, go drink some water. If you don't go drink, if you're not drinking water, then um, well, maybe you shouldn't pee as much. Okay, so your kidney will try to help you. See how a nice organ it is. So it will try to keep more water inside your body and not pee it out. Okay, so that will help you increase the volume and, as a result, increase the blood pressure. Alternatively, um, some of your blood vessel can constrict, squeeze, okay? Then even without increasing the amount of water in your body, your blood pressure will also go up. 
Okay, so that's the idea. Um, so mostly you, your blood pressure, your, your blood vessel don't do that much. So it's really the kidney that's helping you. So um, just to make sure that you know we're all together, um, where am I? Uh, oh, hold on a second. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, let's say your blood pressure is, let's say, let's say your blood pressure is low, okay? Um, then what happened is that uh, your body detects it, it will send a signal to some hormone system, increase the amount of water that your kidney is gonna keep, okay? And as a result, your blood pressure should rise. Okay, so this is the regulation of blood pressure in your body. Um, so, what happened um, to you when you take those three drugs and, and result in this triple whammy bad thing, okay? So, um, so with triple whammy, okay, you might get acute kidney injury, which is uh, measured by very low urine output. Okay, so your kidney is busted. Uh, the easiest to, way to tell that your kidney is busted is that you can't pee. Okay, I don't know whether you've seen this medical show, um, you know, somebody has a surgery or whatever, and you know, like a day or two days, there is no urine output, that means that kidney is dead, okay? So when you are not generating any urine at all, it is a very bad thing. That means either you're de de seriously dehydrated or more likely your kidney is not functioning, okay? So, um, so that will be bad. Um, so let, let me just explain a little bit about um, what our kidney does so that we can appreciate um, how bad acute kidney injury can be for you. So um, your, your body um, pumps bloods all the time and about um, a quarter, a quarter, 25% of the blood that leaves your heart will go to the kidney. That's actually a pretty large amount of blood, okay? So all of the, that blood will at some point hit the kidney, okay? So it will go to the kidney and then it, it goes to the kidney through some blood vessels, the blood vessel branches and branches and branches, just like those tubes in the lung, right? So until it becomes a very, 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 really, really, really tiny blood vessel called aphan arterial, doesn't matter what the name is, it's very, very tiny. The diameter is about 20 to 30 microns, so it's a very small thing. So it takes a little bit of blood and it goes to a filter. Okay, the filter is called glomerulus. I, I, you also don't care about the name, but there are a lot of these filters in your kidney, okay? So if you're a healthy person, you have about a million of these filters, okay? Your kidney, you know, about this size, there are a million of these packed in there, so you can imagine how small these things are, okay? So the blood vessels <coughs> takes the blood and it dumps it in a filter, okay? So the filter is basically a ball of very thin walled capillaries. Okay, so the capillaries, that means their walls are fenestrated, okay? It's got little holes. So if you pump, pump blood into this ball of capillary, and, there's a and you have pressure pressing on this capillary, what happens? It's got walls on the holes, so what? Yeah, something will go through, right? So you're pressing on it, that thing is not, you know, it's got holes. So things that are smaller than those holes will pass. Okay, so what will pass through? Water will pass through small soils like salt, urea, um, I don't know what else is small. Okay, tiny little thing. Big thing should not pass through, okay? Protein shouldn't pass through. If protein pass through, something is leaking and that is not a good thing. And definitely no red blood cells, okay? Red blood cell going through your kidney, you peeing blood, okay, that is not good either, okay? So little thing will pass through the filter, okay? And it will go into a, another tube, not a blood vessel, a tube that's called nephron, okay? Don't really care about the name. But this nephron is super awesome, okay? So what it will do, is going to reabsorb. It's gonna help your body keep what it thinks you need, okay? It's gonna keep most of the water. More than 99% of the water that pass through the filter will be reabsorbed, will be taken out of this um, nephron back into your body, okay? Also, most of the salt, okay, will be taken out of this nephron and back into the body. 100% of the, of the sugar will be taken back in the body, okay? You're like, why? I don't want the sugar. I know you don't, but your body doesn't know. The kidney is gonna dump that way. It thinks you're a caveman that has no food. Um, so the bad stuff that you shouldn't have, like urea, like byproduct of protein breaking down, you know, whatever drug that you've been taking last night, it's gonna come out, okay? So you want enough blood to be filtered to the, into the kidney, going through the nephron, so that you can get rid of the nasty stuff that you've been eating. Okay, so if you don't have enough blood coming here, you don't have enough um, 
fluid for this nephron to work with, then the bad stuff is going to stay in your body and not get peed out. Okay, so to be healthy, you need to be able to maintain a high enough what's called filtration rate. Okay, you need a high enough f um, amount of fluid to be going through into the, into the nephron. Okay, and as a result, you should be peeing, you know, at a regular rate. Okay, so if you don't have in, a high enough filtration and at the same time you don't have enough um, urine output that related, okay, then you have problem. Okay, and you probably have acute kidney injury. Okay. Now, so this is the result of triple whammy. Okay. So then let me let me look at how each of those drugs may lead to these nasty outputs. Okay. So I was saying if you have high blood pressure, you might be taking water pill. Okay. So diuretics is the water pills. So what does it do? Um, its effect is to increase um, urine output. Water pill, okay, it's gonna make you pee a lot. So it will increase um, urine output. You're gonna pee a lot of water out of your body. As a result, but, um, blood volume, the amount of blood, okay, will decrease. So if the amount of blood will decrease, then you don't have, on average, you don't have um, as much blood going into the filter. The pressure here, the filtration pressure is lower, and as a result, the filtration rate, the amount of stuff going into the nephron will also be lower. Okay, so that is consistent with what you see in acute kidney injury. Don't worry, because the kidney is very good at regulating the amount of stuff going into itself. Okay, it knows that it's important to you, so it will try very, very hard to make sure that you have enough filtration. So all, if all you're doing is taking a diuretic, that's not a problem. Your kidney is gonna, not going to die. Okay. Well, but then your blood pressure is really high, so your doctor prescribed some ACE inhibitor as well, okay? This is another drug that targets something else, and it has an effect of, um, well, you know, do, it, it does something to this other arterial, but the end result is that it will also lower the filtration rate, okay? So basically, it relaxes this part, the ex exit arterial, so that it's more likely for the blood to go out by passing the filter. Okay, so it's also going to reduce filtration. Okay, they both have this bad effect. Okay, now if you're just taking these two, as a lot of people with high blood pressure are taking these two, it's still okay. Your body can, your kidney can still regulate. Okay, now, um, you know, because you're hungover, you took this ibuprofen. Okay, so what does ibuprofen do? It does a lot of things, it kills your headache, but at the same time, it also has the effect of constricting this guy constricting what's called the aphan arterial. So that's, that this is the blood vessels that bling, brings blood to the filter. So if you have it constrict, then it's not going to be able to bring as much blood, okay? Not enough blood here, also decrease filtration, okay? So now the question is, can your kidney hack it, okay? Can your kidney just save itself? You're really, really, you're really, really trying to kill me, man, okay? So what am I gonna do? Should I give up or should I try to save you? Maybe you're just gonna kill me. Okay, so this is what happened, and some of the patients, when all these things happen, they just give up and have this acute kidney injury. Okay, so what I'm interested in is this question. So which patient cohorts are most susceptible? So what is it about these people, when they take this drug, they have a, you know, they have a dead kidney, and these other people don't, so why is that? Um, so to understand what's going on, um, we use a pretty big model of blood pressure regulation. Um, when I say we, that means uh, my postdoc, Sami, and my grad student, Jessica. So they work on this um, big pressure model. So when you build a model, you want to know what is, what is the question that you want to answer. Okay. So my um, my interest in this project would be, okay, kidney injury, right? So I'm interested in urine output. I'm interested in filtration into the kidney. So this model represents in fair amount of detail what happened into the, in the kidney when, you know, other part of your body is doing this and that. So this model pr represents the kidney and it, it predicts filtration, which is interesting to me. It also predicts urine output. Now this is also about blood pressure regulation, so I also represent part of the heart that has to do with blood pressure pumping, okay? So the model will predict a bunch of things, cardiac output, um, right uh, atrial pressure, and also mean arterial pressure, 
Okay, so it represents the other thing. And then um, it also represents that hormone system that I mentioned. So there are some drugs, some blood pressure drugs that you take targets a hormone level, not the sex hormone level, but some other hormone level that control you know, blood pressure. So I represent that hormone system as well. And I represent some nervous system that detect, oh my goodness, your blood pressure is too low. So a bunch of things. Everything that um, has to do with blood pressure regulation, I just dumped it in the model, okay? Things that don't, like you know, your toes, your finger, I don't care, they're not there, okay? So this is a pretty good size model, and it is differential equation based. So th this is just a few of the equations that describe the hormone system. Um, in total, there are about 100 of these. Um, so they're just you know a bunch of ODEs, not very difficult um, to solve. So model system have a bunch of couple ODEs and algebraic um, equations, so it's a DAE system, um, a bunch of unknowns, how many parameters, depends on how you count them. Um, so it's somewhat stiff at some point, so you know, we need to be careful with the ODE software, but it's not too bad. So it can predict things like this. I'll just give you some sample um, uh, 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 time profile, and then I will answer my question about triple whammy, okay? So this is a simple ex simulation where I say, okay, I'm going to, for, for four days, I'm going to eat a lot of salt, okay? That's easy, just go, maybe not so easy in France. French, eat healthy, okay? So I always say it's easy because I was in North America. Just go to McDonald's, eat a bunch of food. Um, what is hard is the next stage where you have very low sodium intake. I have no idea how you do that. So when you eat a lot of salt, um, what happened? Um, your, your, you, you accumulate more fluid in your body. Um, you end up peeing a lot of salt out, and then there is some um, response from the hormone. And then when you reduce the salt input, um, the opposite happens, okay? So I'm not gonna go through this in detail um, because I'm more interested in answering my question, okay? Which is, what are the risk factors that make somebody susceptible to triple whammy? Okay, so there are a bunch of things you can consider, um, including gender, you know, your age, race, um, but I'm going to, we started with something simpler, okay? So um, maybe the dosage, right? I mean, you're taking this drug, what do you mean? Are you taking one pill or two pill, right? So um, maybe if you take a lot of them, like a high dosage, yeah, seems intuitive that, you know, you'll be more susceptible. So that's actually kind of boring. Um, the second factor is more interesting to me. Um, it's called in impaired autoregulation. So what is autoregulation? <clears throat> so I told you that, you know, the kidney try to save itself, okay? If it senses that you are not giving it enough fluid to work with, it will do what it takes to increase the brain filtration rate back to normal, okay? That is called autoregulation. Okay. So if it senses that, oh my goodness, you're not having enough um, blood, then what it will do, it will send a signal to this blood vessel that is bringing blood to you to have it relax. Okay, so that vessel will dilate, okay? Therefore, reducing the resistance and trying to encourage more blood to come this way. <clears throat> okay, so if you have more blood coming in, then hopefully your filtration rate will go up. Okay, so this is called autoregulation. So kidney does that. Okay. Um, not every blood vessel or every organ does it, but it's not the best at autoregulation. Do you, do you know which organ is the best at it? Which organ of you do you want to save most? To me, it's the kidney, but I, I suspect you're different. What? The brain, the heart. The heart is pumping, so it's good when it comes to blood. It is the brain. Okay, so the brain is really awesome in um, autoregulation. So, um, so aside from this, I also did a study on um, open heart surgery. So if you have open heart surgery, okay, what you need is, so let's say I need to suture your heart, right? So I need to stop your heart for a minute or two, maybe longer than that. Okay. So I need to hook you up to what's called bypass machine. You know, I'm talking about bypass machine. So bypass machine, uh, so I stop your heart, you're not pumping. So you'll be dead if nothing pumps. So the bypass machine will suck blood out um, yeah, before it hits your lung, okay? And then in the machine, it's going to pump the, the blood full of oxygen, okay? And then it will put it back into your body and pump it around your body. That's a bypass machine. It's bypassing your lung and your heart. 
because your your heart's not going anywhere and no pumping. So you know, forget about your lung too. Probably not. Oh yeah, it has to. I have to open you up so no no breathing for you either. Okay. So that's a bypass machine, and you need that if you know under any doing any um, cardiac surgery. Okay. So with bypass machine, for some reason that I don't really understand, um, your blood pressure is not as high as normal. Okay. It's quite low. Okay. So when your blood pressure is very low, you're not really delivering the same amount of oxygen everywhere. Okay. So you're not giving your brain enough oxygen, you're not giving your kidney enough oxygen, you're not giving your stomach or whatever it is. Okay. Nobody is getting enough oxygen. Okay. So um, in bypass machine, even though you go in with a healthy kidney and you come up with successful surgery, uh, about 30% of the patient will have acute kidney injury. Okay, you never touch the kidney, okay? But because of the fact that you're not giving it enough oxygen, even though it tried very hard, it got hurt. Okay. Now, interestingly, very few patients come up with brain injury, brain damage. Okay. And that is because the brain is a lot better in autoregulation than kidney. I don't know why. I think kidney is more important. Um, okay, so you, oh, that's auto-regulation for you. Okay. Um, another risk factor, maybe water intake, right? If you're not drinking enough water and you're peeing so much water out, maybe that's what happens. So if the patient is not drinking enough water while they're taking this, then bad thing might happen. Okay, so uh, these are the three risk factors that we have been looking at. Um, and we simulate the effect of this risk factor. And we, these are the model output that we focus on, okay. because they are indicator of whether my kidney is in danger. Okay. So I'm interested in blood pressure because I'm hypertensive, I'm taking blood pressure drug, I want to know if they are actually helping, so that's relevant. Um, I'm interested in filtration rate, because if filtration rate is really low, then I'm at risk of having kidney injury. And of course, I'm also interested in urine output because low urine output is basically an indicator of acute kidney injury. Okay? So these are the three model predictions that I'll be showing you. Okay, so um, the first simulation is kind of a control. So this is simulation of a person who are taking those three drugs, but they don't have any of the risk factor. Okay, so I'm just taking those three drugs, and I'm going to show, so there's a lot of bars. Um, I'm not gonna put a legend here, so just focus on what my, I'm pointing at, okay? So this is showing the blood pressure, filtration, you don't want this to be low, and urine output, that shouldn't be too low either, okay? So control means a hypertensive person who is not taking drug at all, okay? So if you're not taking the drug, this is your blood pressure, if you're not taking the drug, this is your filtration. If you're not taking the drug, this is how much you pee. Okay. Now this is somebody who is taking all three drugs, but not too bad. Okay. No risk factor. Okay. So what happened to this person? Their blood pressure dropped. Do you expect that? Yeah, you should, right? You're taking this high blood pressure drop drugs. If the blood pressure doesn't drop, something's wrong with your medication. So this is expected. Um, so your filtration rate is lower than normal. That's also expected because each of those three drugs have the effect of lowering your filtration. Okay. Now urine output is higher. Why is that? Yeah. Exactly, right, because this is what your high blood pressure drug do, okay? So you're taking water, but of course you're gonna pee all the time, okay? So this seems okay, so your filtration is a little low, but not, doesn't seem to be dangerously low, and you definitely, is not showing any indicator of um, acute kidney injury. Okay, now let's mix things a little worse for this person. So I'm gonna take, you know, higher dosage, right? I, my blood pressure is really, really low, uh, high, so my doctor prescribed to me a huge amount of, you know, um, drug and my head really hurts, so I popped the whole bottle. Okay, so um, your blood pressure is lower as you want. Now your filtration is quite low, so it's quite a bit, it's about half a control, which actually is not a good thing, and it's lower than when you didn't have the risk factor, okay? And your urine output is all the way, not much lower than control, but it is about the control level, which should you, cause you concern because you're not peeing more even though you're taking those water pills, which is really weird, okay? So this is what happens if you take a you know, high dosage. And then what if you have all three 
um, risk factor. You're taking a lot of the drug, um, your kidney is somehow don't remember how to auto-regulate, and you even not drinking enough water, okay? So in that case, um, your blood pressure is lower, that's okay. Um, your filtration is quite low also, and your urine output is almost dangerously low. Okay, so these are the risk factors that make quite a bit of difference. And there are other risk factors, if you throw them in, that would be the patient that's gonna get really bad um, kidney injury. Okay, so um, that's one study that we apply our model to. Um, I haven't gone into the sex-specific part, um, which actually is my pa um, uh, passion. I, I like looking at sex differences in diseases, physiology, and such, um, especially in hypertension, because it's quite prominent. So this is, this is um, a statistics of um, men and women with hypertension, um, for different age group. So if you are, uh, let's see, this is um, between 40 and 60. If you are a male, then about you know, more than one third of you guys have hypertension. Women is less than 30%. So they're not like hugely different, but this is a statistically um, significant difference. So they, the, the point is that if you're a woman before menopause, you are protected from um, blood pressure, hyperpressure, and other cardiovascular events. And of course, the, the question is, well, why is that? What's the mechanism? We don't really understand, so um, I've been doing simulation to study that. Um, and then, um, because men and women are actually quite different um, in many, many ways, including that non-sex hormone system that I talked about, um, when we have high blood pressure, we really should be taking different drugs. Um, that doesn't always happen, so I want to understand what are the best medication for men and women if they have high blood pressure, and why is it that you know one, one drug is better than others, and then um, if you have other diseases, I mean, people don't when they, when you're old enough, you just you know get sick from all kinds of diseases. And hypertension drug is not going to be the only one you take. So what if you have other diseases like diabetes, right? So if you are taking diabetes drug. What combination of blood pressure drug is good for you? Okay, the story is different than when you're not taking uh, other drugs at all. Okay, so um, that's one story. I have 15 minutes, that's enough for me to talk about autism. Okay, so switching here, um, autism. So um, the symptoms of autism, um, I think we are all familiar with, it, with them. They usually appear around age two, um, and because the ability to change is better when we're younger, so there are good reasons for us to try to diagnose a child if that child has autism, um, um, uh, 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 syndrome, okay? So um, what we want to do is to come up with a diagnostic method that is child-friendly, okay? easy to do, and can you know, pick up which child is suffering from autism. So how is um, diagnosis done um, nowadays? So usually what, what you do is you go through a very comprehensive um, interview um, or, or yeah, uh, with a psychologist, or you fill out a rather long questionnaire. Okay, so interviewing a child, even if they don't have autism, is, is not easy. If you have children, you will understand. Um, so that is, can be expensive and is, um, it can be somewhat intrusive. So there are other tests um, that are easier to do. Okay? So I, I don't know much about smell tests, and I thought, oh, that was easy, just smell something. Um, but it's not, it has to be, I, I don't know, what, so Mesha can correct me if I'm wrong. So my understanding of this smell test um, is that it has to be associated with somebody's emotion. So you can smell, I guess, somebody's sweat when they are afraid okay, or when they're happy. So the reaction of somebody with autism can be quite different from somebody who is neurotypical. Okay. So um, that's one way. Um, but what we're focusing on is the eye gaze pattern. Okay. So if you imagine somebody with autism, I would think you were imagining somebody who's not looking at you, correct? So that's typical, stereotypical of you know, what we imagine somebody with autism um, does. So the way they look at people or the way they scan somebody's face can be quite different from somebody who's neurological, uh, neurotypical. So um, what we're trying to develop is a technique that will um, 
gather information of somebody's eye gaze pattern, how they move their eyes across somebody's face, and then analyze that eye gaze pattern and see if we can pick out differences between a child who is suffering from autism and a child who's new, new typical. So there are many ways to analyze those eye gaze patterns. So for instance, you can ask the question, okay, so where's the first glance? Okay, so I show you a face, what do you look at? Do you look at my forehead, my nose, or do you look somewhere here because you don't want to look at me at all, okay? Um, or um, I show you a face, and you look at the face for 10 seconds, okay? So what fraction of that 10 seconds are you focusing on my left eye? Okay, which may be better than my right eye. So which part of my face do you spend most time on? Okay. So that will be called fixation time. What fraction of the time that is staring at this face is fixated on the mouth versus the nose versus the eyes. Okay. So these two, first glance and fixation time, are what you call static measure. They don't really capture the way you move the eye, right? So if I could just keep traveling, um, uniformly, it could be the same as if I just spend, you know, um, a fraction of time on the eye, on the nose, and on the mouth. So it doesn't really capture the motion. So if you want to capture how I actually move my eyes, then we can do a network analysis, which is what I will show you now, okay? Okay, so eye tracking. So um, the way the experiment was done is that um, you have a child sitting here, and then you show them um, faces after faces. Okay, so for each face, they stare at the face for three seconds, and there is an infrared machine that will look at the iris and track where in that face that child is looking at. So you're able to tell they start, I don't know where they're starting, maybe they start over here, and then they move around, and then this is what how they, how how their eyes, uh, how the focus move, or they just you know, move like this. So for each picture, you know what the subject has done, how they look at that face. And then you take that pattern and map it into different areas of interest on the face. Okay? So there are seven areas of interest. It could be one of the eyes, um, the cheek, uh, the nose, the mouth, or everywhere else. So you map patterns like this into areas of interest, and you get yourself a graph. And as your eyes move um, among these areas of interest, you basically have a graph. Okay? And then you can do all kinds of centrality an analysis on the graph. And the question is, can any of these measures tell us um, whether the child has autism or not? Okay, so here I'm going to show you uh, two of the centrality results as well as fixation time. So fixation time is what has been used the most traditionally, and these are the things that we propose. So with fixation time, um, the, the uh, measure that has the you know, appropriate p-value would be the mouth. So if you look at the fixation time in the mouth, you can tell rather distinctly that um, a child with autism will focus on the mouth a lot more than one that's neotypical. So the, the blue one is new, uh, neotypical child, the normal child, and then uh, a child with autism would be the orange bar. Um, and then with degree centrality, um, another measure um, under the eye seems to give you um, statistically significant results. Um, with between the centrality, um, actually a quite a number of measures are different between the two population. Okay? So that's, the result seems to suggest that between the centrality, um, it's the best in distinguishing between eye gaze pattern of a new typical um, child and one that has autism. And so our goal, um, which we're still moving um, towards, is to create a child-friendly and non-intrusive approach to identify um, children who are suffering from autism. Okay. So that has been a very fun project. Um, our study actually got written up um, in a number of publications, and Mesher and I were on TV for local news, which I will not show you because I downright refuse to watch any YouTube video that has me in it. Um, I don't know, that's something about me. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and I have never done this in a technical talk. Um, it's about ethics, so can I spend like two minutes on ethics? It's about ethics. Um, it's a new thing for me to try. So um, you can use the same technique, not just to diagnose autism, but other diseases as well, like you know ADHD, um, uh, Parkinson, 
patients, schizophrenia, um, or concussion, right? So, you know, you can do it on a phone. You can stare at a face on a phone, and it might be able to tell you whether you have concussion, okay? So th what does that remind you, a phone and then this is like Star Trek tricorder machine? No, no, <laughs> don't know Star Trek friends? Okay, but, but eye tracking has its dark side, dark side, okay? So, um, for example, okay, uh, let's say I want to sell you stuff. I, I work for this supermarket, okay? So if I have an eye tracking machine here, I can tell how, how my customer uh, look at things, right? What do they focus on? And if I know how they, you know, look at my product, I can arrange them in a way that somehow, you know, help me promote sale, okay? That's a little thing. Um, more importantly is that um, your, 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 the, your iris and the, uh, and the blood pattern, blood vessel pattern, yeah, blood vessel pattern on your retina is unique, okay? Basically, your eyes is unique to you, okay? So if a company stores your biometric data, your eye pattern, okay, as well as some real person information, like your name, your date of birth, credit card information, your national identification number, okay, then any promise of anonymity, okay, it's temporary at, at most, right? So let's say, have you ever lost a credit card? Or have, you know, a company email, Walmart email you, oh my God, we got hacked, okay, please change your password. Have you done that happen to you? Actually, I lost my credit card before the, my trip here. It was a pain um, in the neck. So I have to, you know, call all the company. I have to get a new credit card, new number, call everybody that build my credit card directly. It was a pain, okay? If you, if somebody hack your, I don't know, uh, a bank uh, account, you have to change your password. A pain, yes, a pain, okay? So changing password is easy. What if somebody hack this? They hack your biometrics. How, what do you do? You change your eyes. Okay, change your eyes is a little harder than changing your password, okay? So it can be dangerous. Um, and also, how you look at things, right, um, can tell you a lot, right? So how I look at Sean, do I like him, do I hate him, am I jealous of him, right? So you can tell how I feel about Sean here. Or, Extreme you know, happiness. what? Extreme happiness. Of course, of course, why not? But you know, is it really true though, can you tell? I say that, I smile, but is it really true? Um, or my confidence level, do I look away? Um, or what do I like, you know, which part of you do I look at first? So you can tell a lot about that person. So this is information, a valuable information. Um, here, you know, you have national insurance, but in the States, there is no. So we, we really guard our health data. We don't want insurance companies to have my health data because I don't want them rejecting my claim. I don't want them raising the rates on me because they know I'm going to get sick in 10 years. So maybe information like this, you should be careful. Um, and that leads to um, this possibility. So when you're a physician, you take this oath of um, Hippocrates, right? Hippocratic oath that you do no harm, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So so that's because you are doing something that's in, no, you're handling something that's precious, a person, somebody's health. Um, as a mathematician, I would say, I never thought much of this. I, I don't give it a thought because it's just math. It's just proving theorem, what harm can be done. However, more and more of us are becoming data science. We are, you know, how many of us has mentioned clinical data? Some of us do, I heard a lot of that in our talk, right? So when you handle sensitive data, maybe there should be a Hippocratic O for data science. I don't know, okay? Mm -hmm. Just a thought here. Um, so I'm happy with be, to be working with a lot of people, learn a lot from every single one of my um, collaborators, and I have a happy group, including this guy over here. Um, you know, just a lot of fun. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
<laughs> that was very nice talking, Anita. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I'm wondering with the eye tracking, uh, whether whether it uh, for a, a typical individual who's not autistic, whether the network centrality will vary depending upon whether the face that they're examining is a face that they recognize versus a face of a stranger. Is it um, done differently? I bet it, it is. So I haven't done this. So um, <clears throat> that's actually my next project. I don't know how you've been reading my mind. Um, that's what <laughs> psychologists call trustworthiness. So they show a bunch of faces, and then they show some of those faces again. And they, they, they measure your, they, they record your eye gaze pattern. And um, that, that should be distinction between the two. Um, I have not done um, network analysis on those, but I bet the, some of those centrality measures would be different. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, why wouldn't you take the... Wait, 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 wait. Hold the thought, hold that thought. <laughs> Thanks. Why, when you um, gave that example of taking a, a higher dosage of diuretics, mm -hmm. you don't pee much, why, why is that? Very good question, I'm very good that I noticed it. So how much you pee, is a um, result of many factors, okay? So is how, so this is the kidney, okay? So how much you come out depends on how much stuff you put in, that's the filtration, okay? And how much I take back, okay? So when you take the water pill, I'm not taking back as much, okay? That's why you pee more, right? So, but when you take the th all three drugs, you are really giving me very little to work with. So you give me very little to work with, even though I'm not taking as big a fraction, I end up not paying a whole lot. So it's, it's kind of like your bank account. How much money do you make and how much you spend? Okay, you're not spending a lot, but I cut your salary by half. What are you gonna do? You're still broke. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I also thought um, of the question that uh, Professor Richard made, but uh -huh. in a different way. Like, I have never been to Asia, for instance. But I think that if I go, maybe I'm going to look at, at oh, faces yeah. in a different way. Mm -hmm. Like, is that true? Is maybe you that mean true? like faces of different ethnicity or different yeah. ethnicity looking at faces? No, me, me looking at people that for me are like foreigners, right? I mean, maybe foreigners, but I mean, here there are many sure. foreigners okay. for me, but sure. not in that way, right? Like, maybe. That is maybe at first, many many of them look. I mean, maybe they are. May, maybe for me, it's more difficult to identify mm -hmm. people uh, faces that I have never seen before. That's another very very good point. So um, the study was done in Iran, and all the faces were deliberately chosen to be Iranian. So we're very careful con controlling these variables. I totally agree with you. I can't tell one Iranian from another. I said all Iranians look the same to me. <laughs> Any question? So when, when I was a child, my mom used to say to me, like, don't hold it, you're going to damage your kidneys. <laughs> Is this like true or is this like a, a myth from parents? You have to be superhuman to be able to hold it to the point that you damage the kidney. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible, but I highly doubt you can do yeah. that. Um, I don't know much about autism, but I've heard that it's something related with the interaction of the kid with the external environment. So uh, is there any explanation or to explain the correlation between the different no. patterns? No, okay. <laughs> not at all. I have no idea. And um, I'm not aware that there are various hypotheses, right? So um, what are the hypotheses? I can't remember. So that, you, know, you don't look at the eye because it's too much stimulant. Too, too stimulating for somebody that has autism. They cannot process that much stimulus. But that's a hypothesis, right? Okay. I am not aware that it has been proven beyond a doubt. Thanks. Um, how many false cases could you have from this testing? Uh, a lot. A lot. 
a lot. You mean for like false identification? A lot. So this is not intended to be a comprehensive test. So this is something that's supposed to be easy. You know, you can develop on your app, like on the phone. So you know, you, you do this and say, oh my goodness, there is some substantial um, likelihood that my child has autism. Let's take him now to the psychologist. Right, so this to be like a first step. Uh, did you look at some model reduction with respect to the, um, the prediction that you make? Say so that again. Some other model one? reduction. Some other prediction in terms model, of which one? Model reduction with respect to the 92 variables oh. that you have on your OD systems. Yeah, yeah. In order so to at least um, be object, maybe objective driven model reduction with respect to the type of uh, um, results that you get. Um, so did you ask me if I look at other predictions? Model. Reduction. Okay, so we look at a lot of model prediction. Um, so, in terms of so in terms of that 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 particular study, right? So I show you just three. I show you the 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 blood pressure. I showed you the filtration and urine output. That's it, right? What does it tell me? Very little. So what what I'm interested in is not um, is not whether this risk factor can increase the chance of kidney injury. Of course they do. I don't need a model to tell me that, right? So what I want to know is the mechanism. So these are the drugs that, no, these are the risk factor. How do they lead to a acute kidney injury? So I want to look at the mechanism and explanation that tell me, oh, this is why this patient is more likely to develop kidney injury than the other person. So to understand mechanism, I have to look at a lot of variable. I, can, I have to look at the, the level of different hormones Okay, I have to look at, I don't know, cardiac output, which I never show. I have to look at, you know, what happened to my sympathetic nervous system. I have to look at, you know, which, all the different parts of the kidney, what on earth they're doing. So I look at, do look at a lot of variables. But, you know, I will have to paste it all here. And I don't have them because my, my student look at them and, and tell me the conclusion. So we usually look at, like, not all 92 variables, but a big fraction of those until we understand what's going on. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, so it gets worse and worse. Um, the time scale usually when it is definite, so let so there is a usually an agree a point urine output below which you have acute kidney injury. Okay, if you take that standard, it takes about two days. So you take that drug and then it starts dropping and your body tries to do something and keep dropping. So usually around like at the end of 48 hours um, with, with those you know, risk factor, you have acute kidney injury. Now, uh, of course it depends on how bad those risk factor are. Right? I say high dose, I mean how high? Right? Are you popping the whole bottle or are you popping half of the bottle? Yeah. Right? I mean, is your auto regulation really bad? So I'm talking about average badness. <laughs> so average badness about two days. So it's not a matter of minutes or hours, it's a matter of days. Any other questions? So Thank you.